Five or six years ago, HTC was a titan of the smartphone world, but the past half decade hasn't been kind to the Taiwanese company. It's lost money, market share, and several high profile designers and executives along the way. Nevertheless, HTC's still here and still making pretty good phones, both under its own brand name and for Google under the Pixel contract. The latest high ender to come out of HTC is this, the U Ultra, the first phablet sized HTC flagship for more than three years. So, does HTC still have some of its old magic left? Or at $750 US dollars, is it asking too much for too little? Let's find out. This is our review of the HTC U Ultra. Before we begin, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss more videos as they land, including more on the next big thing from HTC. So the HTC U Ultra is a giant glass slab of a phone. We're used to 5.7 inch devices becoming more svelte and hand friendly thanks to the late Galaxy Note 7 and the just launched LG G6. But this thing is a big bezel-y beast that's a little tougher to one hand than other phones in this display category. Quick size comparison here, that's the Huawei Mate 9 there with a 5.9 inch display and even that is smaller than the U Ultra. Though true, you lose some of that space to the on-screen buttons on the Mate. What we're dealing with here is essentially a super-sized HTC 10 with a really unique and highly reflective polished glass rear, and one or two weird quirks up top thanks to an LG V20 style second screen. For as physically huge as this phone is, it is at least a good looking piece of hardware. HTC still knows how to design a phone, and the build quality is excellent, with flawless joins and a comfortable if slightly slippery in-hand feel. And the back of this thing looks stunning, especially the blue model that catches the light like wet metallic paint. Around the front, HTC's stuck with capacitive keys freeing up some display space, arranged around an excellent super fast fingerprint scanner which doubles as your home key. And despite some fairly aggressive sharpening effects on the display which I don't particularly mind, but may well bug you, the screen itself is impressive with daylight visibility much improved from HTC 10's disappointing 5.2 inch panel. Ok, so let's talk about that second screen for a bit. LG fans may remember it from the V10 and V20, and HTC's implementation of this feature is basically a carbon copy, inheriting all the same pros and cons. For me, the second screen never really goes beyond being slightly useful, with some areas of the software on it being decidedly half-baked. The second screen can show you notifications, music controls, shortcuts to your favourite apps and contacts, and upcoming weather conditions. But the notification side of things, moderately useful as it is, doesn't work perfectly with some apps. Same deal with Music Widget which hilariously doesn't work with anything besides Google Play Music. And the contact shortcut lets you create shortcuts to call people rather than text or instant messages. It's like HTC put the bare minimum amount of work just to get this feature done without really making sure it was fully baked. The same goes for the much vaunted Sense Companion feature which is supposed to use AI, because everything is AI now apparently, to show you weather conditions that might affect your plans as well as traffic updates and something to do with fitness that never seem to appear on my phone. If this sounds like a poor man's version of Google now, that's basically because it is. I didn't find it particularly useful after a week with a phone so I ended up turning it off. Thankfully, the rest of HTC's Sense software is a little more competent. The experience is just as lightweight as on the HTC 10, with a handful of HTC apps complementing an otherwise Google-centric software suite. Blink Feed is still there to bring social updates and news to your home screen. There's nothing too crazy layered atop Android 7.0 Nougat, which is just fine for those of us who appreciate minimal clutter and a stock Android aesthetic. On the inside, the U Ultra packs some small upgrades over last year's HTC 10. A Snapdragon 821, 4GB of RAM, 64GB of base storage plus SD, and a slightly upgraded 12MP camera around the back, and a 3000mAh battery. Now, 3000 isn't a huge number for a phone with such an enormous display, or I guess displays in this case, but I've been pleasantly surprised with how much mileage this phone gets me. The Ultra certainly isn't a multi-day phone, but nor is it anywhere near as anemic as some past HTC efforts like the One A9. I've been getting a good solid day jumping between Wi-Fi and LTE with around 4 hours of screen on time. There's no wireless charging though, disappointingly for a glass-backed phone, but at least you get Quick Charge 3 for rapid refills. However, don't expect to plug anything else into the Ultra's port while it's charging. There's no headphone jack here, and I really don't understand why, it's not like there isn't room down there. Now, HTC does include a set of excellent USonic USB-C earphones in the box which sound great, because they use sound to map your inner ear and tune things accordingly. That's all well and good, but there's no headphone dongle in the box, so you'll have to order one separately to use with your existing cans, this in a phone which costs 750 US dollars. 
At least HTC continues to nail the basics of the smartphone experience though. Day-to-day -day performance is just as great as we come to expect from the company, speedy across the board with fast app load times and no problems with apps getting bumped out of memory prematurely. The HTC 10's 12 megapixel Ultra Pixel 2 camera was the first really great HTC camera in years, and the U Ultra builds on that with a slightly upgraded IMX378 sensor behind the same f1.8 lens along with OIS. I'm not quite as down on the Ultra's camera as Andrew Martinick was in our written review, but it's clear that while it is good, it's not up to the level of some of its immediate competitors like the Google Pixel and LG G6. To me, it seems like the issue isn't the optics, on paper the U-Ultra beats both the Pixel and the G6 in this area, but Google and LG have better processing, which means sharper low-light photos and better dynamic range. The U-Ultra sucks in a lot of colour detail in darker scenes, but fine details are blotchy, and the phone has a tendency to overexpose night shots, which only exacerbates things. I'm pretty happy with the U-Ultra's camera overall, but I hope HTC steps things up a notch in the direct successor to the HTC 10, which is on the cards for later in the spring. Again, it's not necessarily the hardware that needs an upgrade, but HTC's processing. The U Ultra is a difficult thing to sum up. It's not a bad phone by any stretch, and yet it doesn't quite feel fully formed. There's maybe 80 to 85% of a fantastic handset here, but I think there's also a lack of focus. Gimmicky, half baked features like the Sense Companion and the secondary display don't add much to the experience. Meanwhile, on the hardware side, we have a gigantic phone with a relatively small battery and giant bezels that go against the grain of the rest of the smartphone world in 2017. While the back of the U Ultra looks great, the front looks decidedly dated when you compare it to the almost bezel free Galaxy S8 Plus. I really hope HTC can build on the positives here as it prepares its successor to the HTC 10, and more than that, I want the company to figure out what's special about an HTC phone in a market where everyone has great build quality and decent performance, because the few gimmicks of the U Ultra simply aren't going to cut it. For more on the HTC U Ultra, check out our full review at androidcentral.com and be sure to subscribe to us here on YouTube so you don't miss more videos and opinions as they land. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.